following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the mystery behind the Shroud of Turin. And if that doesn't sound crazy <laughs> enough, because he used his own face as the model. A medieval relic in the late 14th century. Or the authentic burial cloth of Christ. And not only is it blood, it's type AB, which is the type that's consistent with Palestinian Jews. What the latest science reveals. The only way that that image could have got onto that cloth is a miraculous one. Today on The 700 Club. Welcome to The 700 Club. Hundreds of thousands of Iranians have taken to the streets in protest. They're not chanting death to America or even death to Israel. Instead, they're crying out death to the dictator. Fed up with unemployment, high prices and repressive rulers, these Iranians are demanding an end to the brutal regime in Tehran. Many of them are also turning to Islam. Chris Mitchell reports. In more than 40 cities throughout Iran, its citizens are calling for regime change with cries like death to the dictator and our enemy is not America. And as it has in the past, the government has sent out its security forces to brutally suppress the protest. Dr. Amir Hamidi came to Israel as part of the Shoshana mission to Israel a goodwill delegation from Iranian organizations outside of Iran. They met with Israeli officials, Iranian expats, and came to tell the world what's happening to the Iranian people. Lots of people uprising because of the mismanagement of the economy, and people are unemployed, people are not working. Food is so expensive, they cannot offer to even eat, and they cannot manage the country. And brutality is unbelievable, human rights are violated, lots of political prisoners, people get executed for no reason. The slogans say it all. Uh, these slogans want to do away with the regime, with the Islamic Republic. They say our enemy is not the United States, our enemy is here in Iran. What they say is we don't want neither Gaza nor Lebanon, our life is for Iran. So it is about themselves and their hopes and aspirations. These protests in 2022 follow demonstrations all the way back to the Green Revolution in 2009 calling for regime change. The question is, could these protests succeed when others have not? Is it realistic that the regime could be overthrown? Absolutely. No doubt about that. Because you cannot force the people to live in past 43 years and they cannot have any freedom of speech, freedom of work. It doesn't exist. Pastor Nazanin Bahistani told CBN's George Thomas how some Iranians are turning away from Islam in the midst of this crisis. They are so fed up of Islam and they see everything from Islam's point of view because the government, the leaders saying that because of Islam, you have to endure. And they say, we don't want to endure this uh, religion. So many, many are calling us and wanting a new God, wanting to look up to Jesus. Christians are persecuted in Iran, but Pastor Nazanin says that where there is more persecution, the people are more courageous, and they continue to spread the message of Jesus Christ. Gordon? Well, Chris, what, what can you tell us about the church in Iran? How is it holding up under this persecution? Well, Gordon, I can tell you, first of all, the church is growing. In fact, it's the fastest growing church in the world per capita. And what it's marked by, Gordon, is Muslim coming to faith through dreams and visions. And one told me these dreams and visions, the number of them are sort of off the charts. So they have an underground church, but they also have a cyber church that's connected to the Internet. And what I'm hearing, and just to echo of what the pastor said, the Iranians, they're spiritually hungry. They're spirit searching for the truth. There's a deep dissatisfaction with Islam. Islam. In fact, some are saying Iran is now a post-Islamic country with only a small percentage of Iranians that actually go to the mosque. Many Iranians, they hate the government. They don't hate the West or America. And the regime, for that matter, they fear the church, and sometimes perhaps even more than Israel. Uh, and many feel the government will collapse and could collapse. And, uh, and some say the church needs to be ready to respond if that happens inside Iran. 
Let's look at the protests back during the Green Revolution. The government unleashed snipers on, on the protesters. You just, we just saw the video where they're uh, beating a man in the street with a baton. Uh, how, how is the leadership responding and is there real potential here to create change? Well, as they have in 2009, Gordon here, they're doing the same thing in 2020. That was a horrific uh, video of that man being beat up on the street. So brutality, that's one of the first things they uh, use. And then the arrests of protesters, uh, what they're also trying to do, uh, Gordon, is shutting down the Internet. They don't want these videos getting out. Uh, and then you have heavy police and security presence to try to stop any protests from even uh, a gathering. And so the question is, will, be, will the protests get to a tipping point uh, to overthrow the government? Many have been optimistic in the past during these previous protests, like in 2019. Uh, but so far, the regime has been able to hold on to power. And that's why many are praying that this regime will fall. And if it does, Gordon, it's going to be a game changer for the Middle East. Well, let's look at Saudi Arabia. And they uh, obviously are a counterbalance to Iran in the Middle East. And President Biden had planned to make a trip over there this summer. Where does that trip stand? Well, right now, President Biden said, you know, he may visit. It's not confirmed just yet. Uh, but he also may uh, meet with the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. And the reason that's significant, Gordon, is that the relations between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia uh, have been very rocky since the Biden administration took office. During the campaign, then-candidate Biden called Saudi Arabia a pariah state. And that's when, uh, when he, and now that he's in office, he released a CIA report blaming the death of Jamil Khashoggi on the crown prince. Uh, but there's two things that put Biden's trip in context. Gordon. And one, Biden needs more Saudi oil to reduce the gas prices in the United States. And the Biden administration, what they're doing is they're brokering talks between Israel and the Saudis to try to normalize relations. And what that will do will try to help repair the U.S.-Saudi relationship. All right. Well, the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Israel, Tom Nides, yesterday said that Israel may be on this trip, too. It is are you hearing rumors that, that he may do a joint trip, one to Saudi Arabia, one to Israel? Uh, that's exactly true. Uh, there is the possibility of him coming here to Israel. Uh, what may prevent him from coming, Gordon, is the fact that right now the coalition is very fragile. Uh, there was a vote in the Knesset yesterday uh, where the government, the coalition government, lost that election. And uh, it's not certain if this coalition government is going to last. And if it's going to go to new elections or there's a change in the government, it's possible that Biden may not come here to Israel, but go directly to Saudi Arabia. All right, Chris, thanks for the insight. Thanks for the reporting. In other news, gas prices have more than doubled since President Biden took office. Efren Graham has the latest on that story from our CBN newsroom. Efren. Gordon, gas prices setting another record high today. The national average now at $4.92 a gallon. That's up more than a quarter from one week ago and nearly $2 a year ago. Many predict the average could reach $5 by the end of the week. The Biden administration blames the war in Ukraine and supply chain problems for the rise. Critics point to the administration's energy policies. Sky-high inflation and a hangover from pandemic spending sprees has some Americans struggling to balance budgets. Despite the challenges, financial experts say there are ways to recover and even start saving. CBN's Brody Carter shows us how. It kind of goes back, and I hate it, but that dreaded B word, right? The budget. Economists and financial experts recommend going back to basics if you're struggling to balance your checkbook. And it starts with that budget. And I think many people, they have no idea how they are spending their money. Inflation is at a 40-year high due to pandemic relief efforts, supply chain problems, and energy supply disruptions given Russia's war against Ukraine. Dr. Stephen Skanky, chief economic advisor at Keel Point, says the U.S. picked up some bad spending habits as COVID relief poured in. As it turned out, almost 70 percent were receiving, of those receiving unemployment, were, were receiving more than they had been receiving when they were working. Especially during COVID, when a lot of us were staying at home, right? We were forced to, we got on that Amazon and it was just that easy click to kind of make ourselves feel happy because it was, those were very tough times. 
All of that happy clicking led to a record $204 billion spent online last Christmas. Given historical job growth, wage gains, and supplemental government spending, stats show real wages have still declined. In retrospect, uh, we overshot on that. Uh, we, we put too much money out there. We uh, didn't have the, the economy ready to absorb it. Money control is 90% behavior. We have to change the behavior. We all know how to do well. Spend less than you earn. It's pretty easy on paper, right? But then that crazy thing called life happens and we start spending more. So Danny Kofke taught school for 18 years. Now he's an author and mentor helping families manage their finances. I recommend starting off, track your spending for at least one month. Then at the end of the month, you're able to analyze it and you can see, oh, we you know, went to maybe Starbucks five times or we did this, whatever it may be in your own personal um, you know, spending habits, then you can look at it and you can cut out those things that are not necessary. Kofke and Skanky suggest investing in wise areas like a 401k and trimming the daily spending. Think about how many hours of work go into a purchase. Let's just say, and I'm just going to make easy math, you know, let's just say you made $20 an hour and something costs $200. Well, think about that. You're going to have to work 10 hours to buy that item. Kofke says you can cut down on spending and build your rainy day fund without sacrificing fun altogether, although you need to practice. And if you begin tracking your spending now, you may be able to save money as early as the next month or so. Brody Carter, CBN News. Time to track spending indeed. Gordon? Uh, I said it before, I'll say it again. Live by the 80-10-10 rule, where you live on 80% of your income. You save. You've got to pay yourself. That's why you're working. You're working for your future. Uh, and if you're not accumulating savings and, and not having that as a regular part of a monthly budget, uh, you're, you're cutting off your future. So if you save 10% every single month and over time, it's, this isn't get rich quick, but over time, you will accumulate things and then you can start thinking about investments and what, what, what would be uh, nice is have your money work for you. And then most importantly, put God first in your life, uh, tithe. If you put him first, then you know he's on your side and you, you're going to get all the benefits of tithing, all those wonderful promises in the Bible about how to open the windows of heaven over you and pour out a blessing. It's a simple rule. It's easy to remember. And when you do it, wonderful things will happen. Terry? Wise counsel. Well, still ahead, like a stabbing knife. That's how this woman described the excruciating pain in her knee. Her doctor said it would take eight months to heal. Instead, she was healed in an instant. She'll tell you how it happened. That's coming up. Plus, a new scientific discovery about the Shroud of Turin. Does it prove the Shroud's authenticity? You decide after this. Is it the actual burial cloth of Jesus or just a medieval forgery? The Shroud of Turin has generated controversy for hundreds of years, and now new scientific evidence gives credence to the authenticity of the Shroud. CBN's Gabe LaMonica has the details. This is the story of a piece of cloth. Seen here rescued from a fire over two decades ago, surviving just the latest in a series of perils across a journey through history. The first gaze upon this mysterious relic resembles a Rorschach's test of damage dating back hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Zoom in a little closer, though. The stains are real blood. And the faint image of a tortured, crucified man comes into focus. Typical medieval portrayals of the crucifixion show the nails in the palms, but the palms wouldn't support the weight of the body. Look longer and the serene face of that man becomes clear. It seems so peaceful in comparison to the violence that you see uh, all over the, the rest of the body. Brian Hyland is an exhibit curator at the Museum of the Bible. There have been questions about the veracity of this image uh, ever since its first documented uh, appearance in the 
late 14th century. In 1988, carbon testing dated the shroud back to medieval times. That test has repeatedly been called into question by various experts. The only single sample they took did not represent anywhere else on that cloth because it had been manipulated. Now, a new scientific procedure dates fabric from the shroud to roughly 2,000 years ago. That Italian study is just the latest in a long series of scientific testing, including studies of pollen plucked from the shroud with this scientific tape dispenser. The pollen samples that were uh, gathered, they uh, a lot of them are from plants that are native to not just uh, the Middle East, but specifically the area around Judea, Palestine, uh, and uh, Syria, as it was in that time period. Um, there's also pollen uh, from the area around uh, Constantinople. There's a lot of pollen from Europe. The pollen samples suggest a journey of thousands of miles from Jerusalem through modern day Turkey and France and now Italy, where the artifact has been kept since the 16th century. Some say the cloth housed in the Turin Cathedral is a vessel for human blood and therefore may be nothing less than the Holy Grail. When you realize that the cloth is a vessel that's containing Christ's blood, I mean, there it is, and it is blood. And not only is it blood, it's type AB, which is the type that's consistent with Palestinian Jews. Still others call this bit of linen a forgery by none other than Leonardo da Vinci. We're saying it's a 500 year old photograph by Leonardo da Vinci. And if that doesn't sound crazy enough, <laughs> we're saying it's a 500 year old photograph of Leonardo da Vinci because he used his own face as the model, because that's the kind of thing he did. Authors Clive Prince and Lynn Picknett even put together their own experiments in an attempt to replicate the religious relic using a bust of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius and comparing da Vinci's disputed Salvatore Mundi painting to the image on the shroud. I'm no expert, but the shroud was being publicly shown 100 years before da Vinci was born. He was a good artist, but it wasn't that good. Barry Schwartz is a Jewish photographer based in Colorado who was called upon to photograph the shroud in the 70s. I was biased against it. And I even said somewhere along the line to somebody that, yeah, you know, we'll get to Turin, we'll give us five minutes, we'll find the paint, we'll come home, we'll be done. Yeah, it's 44 years later. <laughs> there was no paint in it. It's not a painting or an artwork. No brush strokes and another mystery. It's 3D. Scientists using an image analyzer revealed decades ago that the lights and darks of the shroud image translate into dimensional shapes. A normal photograph records only variations in light and does not record information about the distance the camera was from the subject. Now we'll put a picture of the shroud under the camera. This image is clearly recognizable. This can only be explained if the intensity levels of the shroud image itself are encoded with distance information from the cloth to the body. Now, British filmmaker David Rolfe is out with his fourth film, Who Can He Be?, investigating the Shroud of Turin, using the latest tech to digitally extract data encoded in the fabric, revealing a three-dimensional model of a man. We can see what I believe to be the body of the crucified Jesus in front of us on a piece of cloth whereby the only way that that image could have got onto that cloth is a miraculous one, a miracle that emanated from the body uh, with unbelievable amounts of energy, but with an infinitesimally short space of time. No matter the evidence, the Shroud of Turin may always remain a mystery. But for many, this mirror of the gospel, as Pope John Paul II called it, connects them to the divine. Gabe LaMonica, CBN News, Washington. What a remarkable story, what a remarkable image. Uh, when you see that three-dimensional image, it absolutely is inspiring. But the, if you need proof of the resurrection, you don't need to look at the shroud. You can ask God directly for it. And his promise is he will manifest himself 
I encourage people everywhere to pray a very simple prayer. Jesus, if you're real, if you really are my Savior, could you show up? Could you show up for me? And if you pray that with all of your heart, the Bible says when you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. You don't have to trust what other people say. You don't have to trust is the shroud real or not. You don't have to trust is the gospel's real or not. You can have your own experience with Jesus Christ. He will show up for you. He will answer that prayer. Terry? Well, up next, she's the wife of a veteran NFL player and the mother of seven. Kirsten Watson talks about the power of taking a breath when she joins us live right after this. The new girl for getting lots of disbelieving looks because of how many kids she had. That's how Kirsten Watson described herself as the wife of NFL player Benjamin Watson during their many moves. Learning how to take a breath became a breakthrough in her busy life. Kirsten Watson is the mother of seven and chief editor of Mom Life Today. She also co-hosts a podcast with her famous husband, retired NFL star Benjamin Watson. Kirsten knows what it means to juggle a very busy life and feel defeated at times. As she learns how to lean on God through it all, she wants to help other women do the same. In her brand new book, Sis, Take a Breath, Kirsten says we can handle every situation because when we inhale God's word, we exhale peace. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Kirsten Watson. Kirsten, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. You didn't set out to marry an NFL player and have seven children. You had some dreams for yourself after college. Tell me about those. Yeah, I mean, after college, I think I had a list of things that I wanted to do and places that I wanted to go. And not that I didn't do those, but once getting married and going into the NFL life, um, some of that was directed for me. And so it's been great to see how sometimes we have a plan um, and God has another one. And I think when we obey his plan and we lean into what he has for us, um, the fruit of that is much greater than anything we could have ever expected. The NFL life is a lifestyle all its own. And you write about it so well in your book. You had me at the title, Sis, Take a Breath. After the birth of your fifth child, you learned a lesson from a personal trainer. Tell me what it was and how it became a breakthrough in your busy life. Yeah, I w had always worked out. And so I knew what it meant to, you know, lift weights and run. Um, but this trainer in particular said, noticed that I was actually working out incorrectly. And she commented that my breath was not giving me strength and that I was just kind of muscling through the, you know, the exercises that he she had given me. And what I realized at that point was that was describing a lot of how I was living my life. I was doing it well and I, what I thought was well, but I wasn't really leaning on the strength that was given to me by the Lord. And so it just became a different way of looking at how we live our lives, how I was kind of rushing through and just doing my best and trudging through, through things, but how God was offering something else. Even through the hard times, he was offering his words of encouragement, his strength through the Holy Spirit spirit to get me through things that were not only challenging, but in good times as well. So it was, it was that trainer who kind of called me on um, how I was working out that made me think about how I was actually living my life. Well, talk about, about taking a breath, your book, Sis, Take a Breath. You know, it's more than just gritting your teeth and getting through life, just like you mentioned, but you really can take a breath spiritually. How do you do that? Yeah, I think the thing that I'm realizing the most now is the importance of being in God's word. I think as women, especially, we have a lot on our plate and ultimately we want to do everything well. And what ends up happening is we rely on our own control, our own strength to get us through things. And what I'm realizing now is the more that I'm in God's word and I understand how he has moved way before I was here and how he will continue to move way after I'm gone. The power of the Holy Spirit is one thing that I just have not tapped into and understanding how every moment that I have breath is a life that I'm living for him and for the kingdom and not necessarily for myself. And so I think that's the power that hopefully the book is doing to encourage women that, hey, we all want to do our life well. We are all busy and we are all very tired. But God is inviting us into a time where whether we're going through something good or something bad, like he is always speaking. He is always talking to us and encouraging us. 
And when we're in his word, we can always rely on that and be in consistent prayer throughout the day. Um, that gives us strength to move on with whatever we're faced with. In the book, you talk about developing dark alley friendships. That sounds like such a negative. You know, I just envision somebody being attacked between buildings in an alleyway. But you say that those friendships actually have brought you through thick and through thin. And yet you've moved so much. How do you develop dark alley friends? Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because in the dark alley, you do want some people around you. And so the idea there is that you want someone there who's going to stay and who's going to see you and who's going to help you. And so the idea is that, you know, with the NFL, we didn't have a lot of time. I mean, we didn't know how long we were going to be in each city that we were. So it was it was important for me to make friendships, deep friendships fast. And so the idea behind dark alley friends or I say like the no makeup friends or the people and the women in your life that actually see you and know you? Who can you be completely honest with? Who's going to pray with you? Who's going to put you in your place and say, hey, I don't really think you handled that well. And so these dark alley friends is really community. And I think that should be the body of Christ. We, as we sharpen each other, as we're able to speak into each other's lives, it's this idea that we're not doing life alone. And so these friendships, these people that are around us are people who care for us, who understand what our goals are, and understand ultimately we wanna do and follow and become the women that God would have us to be. And so I think sometimes we get into our lives and we're so isolated. And I think the idea behind the friendships is that, hey, we're doing life in community um, and we're doing this to the best of our ability with people around us who actually love and see and care about us for who we are. Well, Kristen, you had you struggled through two miscarriages. You have seven beautiful children, but you you lost two pregnancies within four months, and that would be an emotional trauma for anybody. But you know, talk a little bit about how you manage that, because a lot of people just kind of try to get on with life and carry on, but there's a loss that really has to be dealt with. And it's not just in miscarriages, things happen in life that create that. How did you learn more from the pain of that? Um, I really think when we're in churches and we're listening to worship music, the words that we sing and the words that we read in the Bible are so um, true. So when we see, when we read and know that God is sovereign, when we say that he is faithful and we say these things, it's not until we go through something that we actually can say, I really believe it. And so those miscarriages, I won't say the first one I did not handle well. I went completely into isolation. I kept trudging through. It was right at the beginning of the season. Again, we had five kids at the time. Um, But after the second one, um, it really did help me to realize that I didn't grieve appropriately for the first one. Um, and that I had really had some talking to do with God, like understanding, you know, why this happened. And I still don't know, but I do know on the other side of it that because I was able to speak out about it, there are many women and families that are going through this same type of isolating thing through miscarriage or through things that are tough in life. And what I do know on the other side of that is that when I say God is faithful, I remember his faithfulness during those times. When I say that he is sovereign, although I'm surprised, I know that he's not. And that I use all of those things, triumphs and fails and trials, hopefully to point people back to Jesus. The one to say, hey, I can't say that these things won't happen. I wish they didn't, but they did in my life. But as a result, my faithfulness and my belief in the Lord is so much stronger. And unfortunately, I think it's through those trials that we realize that what we believe is true and not just a song that we sing or a verse that we memorize, but it's through those trials we actually believe what we believe, if that makes sense. Your husband is now retired from the NFL. Is life any less hectic for you? (laughs) No, I have to say that his time in the NFL, which was our first 16 years, um, was great, but I love having him home. It has been so great. Um, I think being home with COVID kind of helped that too, just for him to be home. Our kids love having him home. And it is not less hectic because he is so talented that he's asked to do a million things. So it's more hectic, but man, it's it's a great time to be 
um, starting a new season, really, for our family and for our marriage. And just to see how he's flourishing has been really cool to see. Well, your book is a wonderful perspective on life and how to make it work for you. Kristen's book is called <laughs> Sis, Take a Breath, and it's available wherever books are sold. The title says it all. And boy, we all need that. Kristen, thank you for being with us. Great to visit with you. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Gordon? Still ahead, a torn meniscus stopped this active woman dead in her tracks. The prognosis for healing depressed her and her dog. See what got them back to normal in an instant. That's later on today's show. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. We begin in Washington, where a bipartisan group of senators continues working towards an agreement on gun reform legislation. Proposals include changing criminal background checks to include juvenile records and giving states incentives to enact red flag laws to remove guns from the hands of people who may be dangerous, as well as funding for school security and mental health. The push coming after the deadly mass shootings in Buffalo, New York, and Uvalde, Texas. The House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol invasion holds its first public hearing this week. It's taking the unusual step of broadcasting the hearings live in prime time at 8 p.m. this Thursday night. The Democrat-led committee includes two Republicans, Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming and Illinois' Adam Kinsinger. Democrats are promising support surprises in the hearings. Republicans, though, accuse the committee of putting on a show by broadcasting the hearings in prime time. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by visiting our website. It's CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Emily is a single mom living in Michigan. Not long ago, she was facing an impossible choice. Keep the lights on or buy food. Well, Emily no longer has to worry about that, thanks to you. Emily says even though being a single mom is challenging, her daughter Addie is the best part of her life. She's absolutely amazing. She is just so kind-hearted. She's hilarious. She's sassy. She's incredible. She's my entire world. Before the pandemic, Emily worked multiple jobs just to get by. It is so tough sometimes. It's hard having to balance working two jobs, still trying to be a full-time mom to her as well. It's a crazy life. <laughs> when businesses began shutting down due to COVID-19, her finances took a huge hit. My hours were way less. My second job at the time, we were all laid off because of the pandemic. I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna keep a roof over our head. I don't know how I'm gonna keep food on the table for us. Paying bills was the most stressful thing at that point, getting farther and farther behind on things. And then being like, how am I gonna get groceries? Am I gonna get food or am I gonna pay for the electricity? It was very scary. That was when she found out about Beist Community Assistance Center, an Operation Blessing partner. It's been such a huge help for us, for one less thing to worry about. The volunteers were the sweetest people. And they would just load up the groceries in the car for us. And like when I went, I was kind of just anticipating like a couple grocery bags. They filled my car up. I was so blown away by it. When I drove away from them that first time, I was like, I can breathe again. I knew it was gonna change our lives and it did. Emily is working again, and with the help of Operation Blessing, is able to make sure Addie has everything she needs. She says she's grateful for the Operation Blessing partners who make it all possible. Being able to come and load up a grocery cart full of food, I cannot even explain the feeling. I want to say thank you so much for taking that burden off of me, especially through the pandemic and even going forward. It's helping me set up a great future for my child. This honestly can change somebody's life. You were part of that if you're a member of the 700 Club. You're part of changing lives right here in America. Lots of Americans have a whole lot more month than money right now. And we want to be there for them to let them know that we care, that we love them, and we want to provide for them. 
Operation Blessing is providing millions of pounds of food, over 4,000 distribution centers, partner centers that uh, take care of the stocking and letting people know, yes, there's some food here for you. We want to see you through and your family through. You're a part of that when you join the 700 Club. How? A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help the Hunger Strike Force, uh, to help move those trucks and all of the donated groceries, as well as we're out there procuring groceries for families in need. You're part of it when you join with us. Now, how much is it to join? It's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and join, we've got something for you. It's my father's latest teaching. It's called Putting on the Armor of God. It's all about the book of Ephesians and how you, in these turbulent times, you can put on the armor of God and have the shield of faith to protect you as all these things are coming our way. I want you to have it. It's yours when you call and join. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, up next, a torn meniscus. Eight weeks of rest and the injury might heal itself. If not, surgery and eight months of healing to follow. Neither option appealed to this woman. So see what she did instead while sitting on her couch. Plus, we're gonna be praying for you and for your knees when we come back. A sudden twist followed by stabbing pain. In a second, Robin Brock's active lifestyle was completely derailed. Even her dog was depressed that she could no longer walk at their normal pace. Her doctor said she was facing weeks, maybe even months before healing. What happened instead? Robin was instantly healed sitting on her couch. An excruciating pain. It's like, Lord, why is this happening? I really didn't know what to do. I've never hurt myself like that before. So one evening I was in the kitchen cooking dinner and my foot caught and I just turned and ex excruciating pain came in my knee on the inside and it was like a jabbing knife just excruciating it was just so I never felt it before and then when I tried to walk and took a step it, w it was all over again so that's when I had to hop to the couch I made it to the doctor found out it was a torn meniscus the doctors had said, because it's ripped, give it some time, it might heal, and or we're gonna have to do surgery. And instead of eight weeks of, you know, seeing if it'll heal itself, it would be eight months more more just to heal. I was like, I don't have that, I can't do that. That's just not gonna happen. But I had to listen to my body and I had to stop and, and take things slower. Something that would take me a half an hour walk with my dog, it's taking me an hour. And that, so that's going really slow for her. And it's very frustrating for me. Could be very painful at certain times. So having the knee injury, being having to slow down was depressing. I was like, Lord, heal this. Sitting on the couch, a 700 club came on and, and that's when I saw uh, Gordon on. As we reach forth and, and as we touch that area of the body that needs healing, we agree together, we say out loud to it, be healed and be made whole. May all pain leave me. In Jesus' name, I receive it now. Now what you couldn't do before, do now. If you couldn't move your legs, move your legs. If you couldn't wiggle your toes, wiggle your toes. If you couldn't make a fist, make a fist. Raise your arms to him and begin to praise him and say, Lord, be glorified in me. So when he said, put your, you know, let's pray and put your hands on the part that's hurting you. And I put it on my knee and we said the prayer. And I know when I'm saying it, afterwards I'm just thinking, Lord, really? You know, am I worthy of this? You know, by faith, I'm gonna do this. I'm, by faith, I'm gonna walk. 
and I was walking, it wasn't hurting. And, and it was only within, you know, a short period of time after being diagnosed, and it's like, okay, so this is awesome, this is a miracle. It, it was just an amazing feeling. It was just like, thank you, Lord. In my heart, I felt so joyful and back to myself. My dog, she was, oh my goodness, she was so happy that mommy's back to walking fast. You could see the delight in her step. I know that God healed me beyond a shadow of a doubt. And believing in Him, and having Him as my Savior, is, is just the most amazing thing in the world because everything is possible. I'm His daughter. I'm made in His image. He doesn't want me to be hurt. And anybody can ask and be healed Anyone can ask and be saved. Anyone can ask. We are children of the Most High God. His arms always stretched out to us, his ear tuned in to what it is we're experiencing, living, needing. I was reading a devotional this morning that talked about God wrapping his love like a blanket of light around us. And it's there. It's there. So today we want to take some time to pray for you. We want to take some time to lift up your needs together in unity, all of us before the throne. And we believe that God is going to stretch his hand out and touch you right at your place of need. I want to encourage you with more. This is Bill who lives in Dallas, Pennsylvania. He damaged his shoulder in 2019 and since then was suffering agonizing pain. On May 13th, just last month, Bill was watching this program and Gordon, he heard you say, there's someone who has suffered with a broken shoulder for years. It happened in an accident. It's very painful for you to move your right arm or your right shoulder. There's a shooting pain that goes up into your neck. God is healing all the bones, all of the tendons, all of the muscles, everything concerning it. You just felt a heavy weight going to that shoulder. God's healing you. So by faith, Bill stretched out his arm. The pain was completely gone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's one. It's Victoria from Alden, Minnesota, who lived with chronic neck pain from degenerative bone and nerve issues. She was watching this show last month, May 3rd. She heard Terry say, there is someone you have some kind of degenerative bone disease. You are in chronic pain all the time. The pain is so deep that it's just a constant ache throughout your body and it's beginning to twist some of your bones. God is healing you from that right now. Just receive it. Begin to praise him for it. Receive it. You are being healed. As Victoria thanked God for her complete healing, she knew it was true. She called the CBN prayer line, praising God for her healing. Robin said something that I think a lot of people ask that question, am I worthy? Am I worthy? And the answer is, Jesus makes you worthy. He makes you worthy. She answered her own question saying, I'm made in the image of God. I'm, I'm his child. When you have that understanding of who you are, who created you, who formed you from the dust of the ground, who breathed life into you, who gave you life and came to give you more life and more abundant life, well, then it all falls into place and you have everything you need to believe for healing. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son. Who did he give it to? He gave it to you. That whosoever, you can be a whosoever, would believe on him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. If you have the faith to believe for salvation, you have all the faith you need to believe for healing. So in an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Do exactly what Robin did. Lay your hand. I believe in the laying of hands. Lay your hand. It's an act of faith. Then say, Jesus, I thank you. I thank you. Come into his presence with thanksgiving. And then he'll do what he promised to do. He promised that he would forgive all your iniquities and he would heal all your diseases. Let's pray. 
Lord God, as we reach out, we reach out with hands of faith and we lay it on that area of the body that needs healing. We come into agreement now touching it. Your word says, if two or more agree touching anything. So we love your word, for you are your word. You stand over it to perform it. You watch over it. Watch over us now, Lord God. And let your word become flesh in our bodies now. Heal all our diseases. Carry away all our iniquities. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that you have given us your word and it has caused us to hope. Now, stretch forth your hand. Manifest your presence. Be the, that, that wrapped blanket of light around us right now. Open our eyes that we can see it. Open our ears that we can hear. And give us a heart of understanding that we may know the greatness of your power. May we be healed now in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. Yeah, you know, there's a woman, your name is Vicki, and as Gordon's been praying and talking about hands, you're saying to yourself, my hands are the problem, such pain. And right now you're lifting your hands because you can't lay them on themselves. And so God's healing you right now. Just feel that warmth come into your hands. Just begin to lift your hands higher and praise him as he sets you free in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've got a swollen liver, and it's it's like um, the the right side of your body just it's it's so swollen it's expanded it's it's from an an infection and you're actually blaming yourself and and you're saying can you know I, I'm the reason my liver is damaged and you you just just forgive yourself for that because Jesus has forgiven you. He's setting you free from the consequences of your actions. He is going to give you a new liver. He's renewing you right now. He's taking away all the scarring, all the problems with the liver enzymes. That swelling is going to decrease. You're going to have life. You're going to have it abundantly. He has a plan and a purpose for you. So just reach out and walk into that. Reach out and receive your healing right now in Jesus' name. And there's someone named Todd. Todd, you, your request has been heard. You've never even shared it with anybody else. And today you've brought it before the Lord. It is in process, but you begin to thank God for it now, believing that what you've asked for is already come to pass in Jesus' name. There's someone, you're in a neck brace and you're saying, please say neck bones. And so I'm saying neck bones just for you. Be healed now and be restored. Someone else with a right shoulder problem, just reach that right arm up to heaven and receive complete movement and complete healing into that right shoulder. There's someone else, you've got cancer on your tongue and you're facing all kinds of medical consequences. They're, they're talking about surgery. They're talking about other things. In the name of Jesus, be healed. All of that cancer, leave your tongue and your throat right now. In the name of Jesus, be restored. Including someone, you have a tumor in your inner ear that's affecting your hearing that may require surgery. You're being healed in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for all the miracles you perform. For you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you, and we're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our honor, our privilege to pray for you. Here's a word. Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will sustain you. God bless you. We'll see you again.